Hey everyone, good afternoon. Thanks for hopping on. So today I want to kind of cover what all I've seen this week, um, some broader thoughts on the announcements uh, coming out of the uh, Spark uh, Plus AI Summit, and then go through some of the workshops specifically and, and talk about that. Um, I wasn't able to go on yesterday uh, due to some technical issues, so I've still got uh, some thoughts I want to share there. So let's go ahead and dive right in. So the biggest thing uh, from yesterday that uh, that I saw was a session on uh, the adaptive query execution. So I kind of wanted to start with that. So, and uh, let me just pull this over here. So this is the Databricks announcement for Spark 3. And you'll see uh, adaptive query execution and dynamic partition pruning are, you know, the number one bullet. Um, you get almost double the performance improvement over Spark 2.4 if you're able to utilize that. And so the session that I had specifically in mind was called Adaptive Query Execution Speeding Up Spark SQL at Runtime. It was about an hour long and it had some really solid demos, but a lot of it is uh, covered in this blog post as well. These all can be found on the Databricks announcements page, by the way. Um, and so there's also a, a notebook you can see uh, for that demo. Um, it was some members of the Intel engineering team and then uh, someone from Databricks that were leading that session. So you got to hear straight from the engineers. So the idea is that instead of determining your query execution plan ahead of time on what could potentially be stale data, and actually I just realized I need to change my display setting. So while I talk, I'm going to do that. I don't want to be broadcasting in a, in a size where you're going to have to put on your reading glasses. Anyway, instead of calculating that ahead of time and then sticking to the plan, even if it's out of date, what this lets you do is basically check back in, uh, with the execution plan as you go through queries. So each stage within a Databricks job, like let me just write up an example. So one of the examples they gave was if you're doing um, select average of X um, and then Y, and then you're doing that from table T, and then you want to do a group by and an order by on uh, on each field. So we'll do a group by Y, and then let's say we'll do an order by on the average of X. And so what this uh, leads to is uh, two uh, query stages, because you first have to do your aggregation uh, your, your partial aggregation to go ahead and do that uh, grouping and then you're actually going to go into your to your next stage and go ahead and, and actually you know create your aggregates and so what you can do is create a boundary between each of those query stages and that's when you can go back in and uh, re-optimize so it's at the query uh query border essentially within your larger query plan. And so once you ran those leaf stages, let's say for instance, um, you had, you know, 50 partitions planned, right? And the data comes back from that first query. Um, and after the shuffle, you've got your 50 partitions, but let's say they have an average size of, I don't know, only like 10 megabytes, right? So what the, AQE tool would do in this case is go back and let's go back to this graphic. It would go back and go into this re-optimization phase um, before moving on. And so it would dynamically coalesce the shuffle partitions. So if there's too few or too many, it's going to readjust to compensate. So if you look at this graphic, this is without any partition coalescing and notice these three here in the middle are undersized we sort of have skew partition sizes right so what aqe can do 
is isolate these after the results of that first query and then for the next query stage go ahead and push those together and treat them as uh, one partition. Another thing that AQE does is dynamically switch your join strategies. So again, a lot of this comes down to having stale statistics, right? And so if you have some estimate on the right hand side of a join and you think that it's going to be uh, uh, bigger than uh, the broadcast hash join threshold, then you can misestimate the size and then have a bunch of complex operations to compensate rather than just doing one scan of the data. And so what AQE does is replans the join when the query gets run. And like in this case where we uh, estimated an 18 uh, uh, megabyte storage size and it's actually eight well now it realizes that it actually doesn't need to do the sort merge it can just do a broadcast hash which is going to be much more efficient and it's going to convert it over to runtime or it's going to convert it at runtime and so this uh, type of join has way less network traffic it's a localized shuffle so it's going to be much more efficient and so uh all of this is being performed without overhead either, um, which is pretty cool. So rather than requiring you to manage all of your uh, table statistics and all that metadata on yourself and sort of have that data hygiene that is obviously always a target, but it's kind of hard to keep up with in practice, you get that handled for you by Spark. Similarly, when the data is unevenly distributed among partitions, and you get severe skew, it can dynamically optimize those joins as well. And so you'll see up here, if you look at table A, you'll see that this partition is significantly bigger than all the other partitions, right? And so what Spark can now do in real time is split that partition, this A0, into two more sizable chunks and then it will duplicate the pairing that it was going to be joined to, like it's uh, B0 on the other side. And so now each of these duplicate B0s have a fairer sized chunk of A0 to join with. And so we're going to be able to have a more optimal uh, join because we have five tasks running now instead of four where you know these bottom three would finish way before the first one did and so we're not properly using the uh, resources available on the cluster and so this this can really speed up and in the same amount of time get you uh, the results and so the this is the graphic i was talking about earlier that kind of shows your um, performance so you can get up to an 8x speed up in certain queries um, and 32 of the queries had a greater than 10% uh, speed up. So pretty cool stuff. Um, most of it comes from, like they're saying here, the dynamic partition coalescing and dynamic join strategies since this specific data set doesn't have skew. So if you're in a real-time environment that is likely going to have SKU and be able to use all three, you're going to see even better results. Now, how do you use it? So it's just a SQL configuration. Spark SQL adaptive enabled needs to be flagged as true. It's defaulting to false in Spark 3. And it uh, gets applied if it's not a streaming query and it contains at least one exchange. Um, it can't work on streaming queries for the same reason that a lot of aggregation based optimizations can't work on streaming queries. Uh, you can't really get statistics on a table when the table is unbounded. Uh, simple as that. Similarly, it needs to contain an exchange. Otherwise there's not really that much to optimize on. Right. And so, so that's the idea with AQE. So. This is, a, this is a huge achievement for Spark. Um, it's been 
a, a, a topic of research in the database community for a really long time and it's exciting to see it now literally just sitting here as a flag that you can flip so i would check out that workshop for sure if you want to see more here and kind of get uh deeper into the details they have plenty of examples in notebooks where they actually show you the query plan uh being optimized in real time like what it would look like with this turned off versus with it turned on so that is uh that's aqe now i want to go ahead and talk a little bit more about the spark 3.0 announcement um honestly like and it's kind of weird this is something that it, it's open source right so it's not exactly like this stuff uh, and let me actually pull up some notes here it's not like this stuff is uh brand new either you know especially if you follow the actual spark uh open source um project you can you know trace this through the news group uh, uh pretty easily and so I'm still blown away though by seeing how it all comes together and especially when it's being presented uh, by Databricks and talks about um, uh, talks about what their vision for the future using this is. So that's that's pretty cool to me. Um, ANSI SQL compliance, I haven't run into as much, but I think it's going to be useful. I've talked about the improved Pandas APIs. Um, that's one of the sessions I did sit in. Let me see if this actually has, um, I want to see if this has a code sample. Yeah, perfect. So here you can see, you know, I don't know who in the chat uh, or watching this later uses pandas frequently. I, I, I'm a, a big pandas fan. Um, I've kind of moved on more towards a, a PySpark workflow simply because I started working heavily in PySpark before Koalas was, uh, was deployed, like it was announced last year at Databricks, or sorry, at the Databricks Spark Summit. So anyway, if you write pandas, this does not look like pandas. This is some nasty Java style boilerplate, right? Now, with type hinting, you get uh, the ability to mark up your objects going into functions and throughout your uh, code. And with Python type hinting support within pandas, you can now do type hints for pandas UDFs. So it's articulating what gets input and what gets returned but it's in a much more readable format than this. And so if you just take a look at uh, these, these three code examples, they all do essentially the same thing. They all have similar input and output, uh, or sorry, they're all just differentiated by their input and output types, right? And so that makes it work differently um, uh, semantically. And so, if you read this instead, you can easily see, oh, one returns a series, the other returns an iterator on a series, and the other returns a data frame. And each of those have different purposes and specific reasons. We don't necessarily care about anything beyond that. It goes back to one of the primary principles of object-oriented programming, where the type signature is really what differentiates these functions. And it's easier to read and, e and thus easier to maintain. So, so that is uh, the pandas um, uh, or koalas type hinting um, using the pandas APIs. I wish I had taken a screenshot of this um, from Matei's portion of the talk, but they also showed off uh, the new error handling within PySpark. So instead of having a Java-based stack trace that gets vomited out, essentially, you have a error code that actually is telling you what's going on within your Python code. So if you have something that's triggering, like let's say the example they use is a divide by zero error, um, you're no longer reading a bunch of Java 
that within there maybe buried is the Python error code that kicked off the exception. So that's going to be huge. I talked about this on Wednesday, but I did not show an example of it. So this is what the new structured streaming tab looks like. So I've requested uh, private preview access to several things. Sorry, let me go back. I thought it brought me to the middle of the article, but this is where I want to be. So I requested access to this. Um, and I'll, uh, similarly to some of the other new preview features, I will the second I get access, be going live and doing some demos of this, I assure you that. So basically it's displaying, dis displaying some statistics that previously you could maybe write yourself off of logs or if you're using something like Azure Event Hub, you get a, a, a similar interface there, but this is integrated within Databricks and it helps you better reason about your stream. So, for instance, this is obviously a real stream. Well, if you're doing a batch through a stream, like say you're reading out from a batch delta table into another delta table like you would do for your lake house infrastructure, then this makes it easier to understand where bottlenecks might be if we have uh, something that's taking longer than it should, or even something as simple as if we're looking at web telemetry and our input rows are too low, then you can understand um, that there's something wrong with the query before you wait for it to finish and look at the outputs. So that's the new streaming tab. There's also a bunch of speed ups for calling R based CDFs. Um, I don't do that very much. But for uh, more academic data science, where you're implementing more of your own um, algorithms or working uh, directly with uh, numerical structures like vectors and matrices, being able to do uh, R-based UDFs is invaluable. So that's huge. Um, the focus of the release uh, as far as uh, bug fixes is mostly on Spark SQL and the Spark Core. Um, so really, it's yet another release where there's not going to be any migration. It's not like Python 3 where some people are going to be trapped in purgatory. And so uh, it's just a really exciting release. Um, definitely fitting, of the t fitting with the 10 year anniversary of Spark. Kind of crazy to think how far it's come just in that short amount of time. Um, and really, if you look, uh, if you look at what they focused on, it's kind of wild in that 10 years, it's gone from being a primarily Java and Scala based language within the Hadoop ecosystem where you're manually managing RDBs and working directly with, you know, your, your cluster management and your distributed architecture to being something that is heavily based in Python and SQL, I believe they're 70 or 80% of the overall usage in Spark right now. Um, and we have things like the data frame and Spark SQL APIs that make it so that really you don't have to mess with RDBs anymore unless you're doing a, a fairly esoteric task. And with Databricks, I haven't deployed a Hadoop or Spark cluster uh, manually in three or four years, and I can't imagine going back. Um, it's one of those things where it's it's kind of fun to do. It's almost like you know making your own pizza or something, but it's also very satisfying when you hear a knock at the door and someone just has a hot pizza for you, right? And so that's that's kind of where we're at with this with this hybrid managed approach on Azure. Um, if you look at the runtime total here to process 30 terabytes of data, it's dropped almost in half. We talked about the performance uh, granted by AQE, and that's where a lot of it comes from. Um, we were just looking at this chart with or without dynamic, uh, or sorry, with or without adaptive query execution. This would also be a good time to talk about dynamic uh, partition pruning. So essentially, uh, again, if you don't have good statistics on your data, the optimizer is not going to be able to figure out uh, what data skipping it can perform. Um, this happens a lot in uh, star schemas, 
So that's your sort of uh, dimensional uh, and fact table based approach to uh, data models. So you could have one or many fact tables referencing any number of dimension tables. That, that's your star. You have your fact and then you have all your dimensions branching off of it. Well, when you do a join, um, if you uh, if you read certain partu uh, partitions in from the fact table um, by filtering the dimension tables, you get an, a crazy uh, improvement in throughput. You can get between uh, 2x and 18x uh, performance improvement in uh, 60 out of the 102 queries they tested using that TPCDS benchmark. And so I know at Valorum, um, we're heavily invested in the star schema because of uh, Power BI. And so having this work uh, and make, uh, make our tables and, and uh, queries more performant, you know, where they're at without us having to go more towards a denormalized structure is huge. Now, obviously in the future, um, if the writing's on the wall about, you know, your, that you're heavily used, um, data platform tool not being compatible with the type of schemas that you typically deploy, you you start reasoning about like how to move away with that and what the future, move away from that and what the future looks like. But for now, it's really nice to have that. So if you, uh, if you've ever accidentally uh, labeled a column or some object within your Spark SQL as an ANSI SQL keyword, um, you can now block that natively. You can also dynamically check for overflow of numerical operations at runtime and have compile time uh, enforcement of inserts uh, with, a, with a predefined schema. So all of that goes to improve uh, data quality, which is always welcome. There's a couple new types of join hints. Um, I'll leave that uh, for you guys to go read about if you're curious. This is the chart I was talking about where, and I, I said it was 70 or 80%. Um, it's, it's closer to 90% if you look at the combination of SQL and Python here, which, which really explains why that's a key focus of the development area. Um, and these are statistics collected by Databricks. So there might be a little bit of bias there in the sense that if you're doing uh, non-managed Spark engineering, like doing Spark not on Databricks or um, EMS or something like that, or EMR, then you might maybe see a different layout. Those people might be more uh, likely to use Scala still, but we're a, we're a Databricks crew here, so it's really exciting to see. Um, so really, that kind of covers it. Um, they did talk a little bit more about Project Hydrogen. Um, that's a GPU acceleration framework that's pretty neat. Um, but I, you know, I haven't had a, I haven't had a time where I really needed that yet. Um, I'm sure in the future, hopefully I'll get to do some more consulting within some of those massively scaled uh, deep learning initiatives and give it a spin. So this is sort of an overview. And then this is already available in the Spark 7.0 runtime. Um, I've given it a shot. There's a couple of my connectors and third party libraries that aren't ready yet. But other than that, I was already starting to see uh, pretty decent performance improvements just using it for sort of my ad hoc analysis. Um, so that's that's all really exciting stuff. So that is Spark 3. And then the next piece I wanted to cover was the next generation uh, data science workspace. Uh, they're calling it Projects. And so I talked about this the other day too. Um, but I wasn't able to give any screenshots. So this is uh, extending on the open and collaborative notebook idea where you have these interactive real-time notebooks that are awesome for collaborating with your fellow data scientists and other members of your data team. And so 
that gets uh, that gets extended with native support for the Jupyter format. So now uh, notebooks actually save as the proper Jupyter f uh, format natively. So you could sort of share that with another open source team or another team that's using Jupyter and not be locked into Databricks essentially, which is always nice to see. There's also additions to the Git-based collaboration. Um, so data ops and ML ops is becoming a huge part of my day-to-day -day work. And I think that's happening across the, the data ecosystem. And so what this keeps pushing is the idea of having, similar to how you'd have a GitHub project or an editor DevOps repo, it keeps all of that in sync using Git, but with native support for branches, project dependencies, and syncing directly with whatever your um, uh, hosted Git environment is. So really just reducing the friction there. And uh, that also allows you to get um, CICD pipelines that help you transition from your experimentation and R&D phase all the way up through your production deployments. And so you kind of have this uh, API surface that allows you to integrate your development workflows with automated CICD. And that makes it so that you can push uh, data science or ML code um, that's in an experiment up to a production model faster. Um, and that's where you can leverage your scalable uh, production jobs um, uh, using uh, Databricks auto scaling on the clusters. You can use the MLflow model registry and also some of the uh, newer uh, model serving capabilities that were announced. So really a, a pretty huge release. Um, they've got some screenshots here. Um, this is still in preview. Otherwise I'd be showing you, I assure you. Um, I did request access to this as well. So we'll see. So this um, integrates natively with Azure DevOps, GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab, and uh, on-prem uh, versions of each of those tools. So you're not going to be able to do your self-hosted Git yet, but you know at this point, I'm not quite sure if what you still would be anyway. So when you first create a project, you can clone from a Git repo or create your project and then integrate it with Git later. Very similarly, very similar rather to the paradigm that uh, Databricks currently works with as far as version control. It also makes it so that when you uh, need to, you know, for instance, have a feature branch or an exploration or experimentation branch, uh, you can easily do that in the UI. So you can create a new branch, edit it, collaborate on it, and then push it back into your main repo over on GitHub or whatever your Git uh, environment is. So if you look at this workflow, you're, you're able to go from development and experimentation into your versioning, your code review process, whatever your testing phase is, back into production within Databricks. And so merging between these two layers is really quite huge. Um, if you've used uh, GitHub, or sorry, Git integration, version control integration with Databricks at this point, it works really at the per notebook level. There's not really a CI CD mechanism here. And so being able to have native support for different branches is huge. So in the future, um, if you look, this requirements.txt, which should be uh, familiar to any conda people out there or your conda.yaml, automatically activates an environment that gets scoped to your project. So if you've ever worked with ML tools, like um, they mentioned NumPy, to me, the one I first think of is um, NLP applications. So oftentimes you're installing, say, a dictionary of words, right? And that needs to be stored locally. Well, it can sometimes be tricky to get that installation of, say, the dictionary pushed to all your clusters and have it available across your environment. So this is really neat, and it's automatically going to push that environment to any one of your clusters. So even 
in an auto scaling environment where you could have clusters being added or removed dynamically as they get added those workers are going to have the exact same environment as uh, everything else which is pretty cool they also um, deployed a Jupyter uh, editor inside of Databricks. So if you right click on a notebook now, you'll have the option to open it up and open it up in Jupyter. Um, I could see this being very valuable for people who just have the Jupyter uh, keyboard shortcuts and interface, like they're, they're just know it like the back of their hand. And it's a great thing, uh, similar to those Koala's APIs where there's a lot of data scientists who are used to working with these tools and rather than try and force them to learn something new, you can kind of meet them where they are and get them using Databricks without a huge transition cost, which really works out well for everybody. So this is the announcement. It has, uh, it has more interactive videos rather than just the, the GIFs, but um, I, I thought that one was really good. And then next, I wanted to talk about the Redash acquisition. So I think we've all been in a spot where we're in Databricks, we're working with some data, maybe it's new, maybe it's just an experiment that you're running against something that's relatively stale. What Redash lets you do is instead of trying to get that data in Power BI or connecting Tableau to your cluster, you're going to have a native uh, BI uh, dashboarding tool available inside of Databricks now. And so you're able to compose uh, SQL and NoSQL queries within uh within your um, Databricks environment to start generating these visualizations and dashboards. You can share them out, schedule refreshes, get alerts to a REST API with a broad support for, with a, a, a broad number of uh, da uh, data sources that it supports, specifically uh, Delta Lake. And so if you look at the interface here, it's pretty similar to other visualization tools. Um, if you're used to, um, uh, this kind of uh, tooling like Power BI or uh, Tableau, like I mentioned. We can see here um, it natively is integrating with all your Delta tables available on that cluster. You're able to write SQL queries against them, get a table, and then turn that into a visualization. Um, I've been thinking of it like the built-in visualization tool within notebook cells, just like on you know steroids. And then you can turn that into dashboards and they get persisted and are shareable, have their own refresh schedules, et cetera. So what this really does is takes away um, maybe the heaviness of doing another uh, type of reporting or dashboarding tool for more ad hoc analysis. So if I were working on an experiment, I might make a little dashboard for myself and check it throughout as I munge different data or clean it up to kind of keep track of progress and see where I'm at. So I think, I think the Redash acquisition is gonna be huge, um, especially as, you know, at Valorum, especially we're moving more and more and more things into Databricks. And so the more things you can do without leaving Databricks, the better. So next, I wanted to talk about koalas. So we already talked about this a little bit. Again, koalas got announced last year. This year, they announced koalas 1.0. Um, pretty huge year for that team. If you look um, at this API coverage throughout each version, we can see that it's getting incredibly close to covering the full data frame API and series API index is lagging a little bit more behind, but index is kind of a, a pain anyway. Um, so that's understandable coming from here to here so quickly is just huge. And you can see the daily download growth is going up quite a bit as well. Um, around 20% of PySpark users are using Koalas by Databricks estimate. Um, so to me, 
like I was saying earlier, I didn't, I'm not going to go from Pie Spark to Koalas. To me, what that's saying is that's 20% of people who might not have considered using Databricks or Spark that are now able to transition their Pandas code and workflows on the Databricks and start using that platform instead, which is great. So that's Koalas. Um, I showed some code samples earlier, but you know, one of the things I wanted to point out is that you can now easily convert using uh, Spark transformers between uh, Koala series columns, etc. So you're kind of, if you're in that pandas paradigm, you're now able to work with those structures more natively, which is pretty cool. So then, oh, and actually I want to point out too, you can cache uh, pandas data frames now as well. So used to, you might have to transform it into a Spark data frame, cache it, and then transform it back uh, at execution time. But here, it's only required to transform once, even after multiple executions. So pretty cool stuff. Then Delta Engine. Um, this was such a cool um, part of the keynote. So if you didn't get a chance to watch this on Wednesday, I would highly encourage it. Um, this is the master class of uh, software development and computer engineering. So the whole point of Delta Engine is trying to better scale execution performance. So we're not able to squeeze more performance out of silicon right now. Um, we sort of plateaued right around four gigahertz for uh, clock speeds on traditional CPUs. And so what you have to do instead is find better ways to use the existing architectures and basically get more performance out of, um, out of the CPU instead of asking the CPU to get better. And so parallel processing has been the biggest component of that. Um, I, I, I probably should recognize, uh, I don't need to tell anyone who's interested in watching an uh, hour-long uh, Spark recap about parallelism being a huge part of, uh, a huge part of modern data engineering, but here we are. So data, data engines typically need to be specifically architected to take advantage of that. What Delta Engine does is basically pushes that down the stack so that you're able to accelerate Delta Lake performance for SQL and data frame APIs uh, natively without having to manage it as part of, say, your um, data framework. And so the three components that they made were a query optimizer, a native execution engine, and a caching layer that sits between the execution layer and the cloud storage. And it uses C++ uh, vectorization techniques to accomplish that. So the query optimizer takes the Spark 3 based uh, optimizations, the uh, cost based optimizer, the AQE and the dynamic runtime filters, uh, uh, that partition pruning and enhances that even further with additional advanced statistics to deliver up to 18x performance in those star schema workloads we talked about earlier. So uh, I think there's a graphic here down below. Um, and actually, let me, let me see if I can't pull it up. Because this is, yeah, this is kind of a, a huge thing. Um, so Delta Engine sits between um, your Delta Lake and your consumption sources. And so if you've seen this, this is basically the Delta or uh, Data Lake House um, built on Delta Lake slide that's been getting passed around over the last three or four months. The difference is Delta Engine is sitting between these sources and your Delta Lake to accelerate it further. That's why the star scheme is important because this is really accelerating a data warehouse built on top of Delta Lake. And so really it's pushing that 
data lakehouse paradigm into maturity through this accelerated performance. And so you're seeing things like this happen with Azure Synapse too. Um, and you know, this is similar. The advantage is that it's going to be natively integrated on top of your Delta Lake. And there's not really any, uh, any alternative on this Synapse side yet for that. So, so that's what the query optimizer does. The caching layer can automatically encode input data into more CPU efficient uh, formats. And so that essentially leverages the SSDs that are in most computers and even data centers at this point. So you get uh, improved scan performance. So those all lead into the um, native execution engine, which uh, is uh, Photon. So it's, uh, it's an engine within an engine, right? And so it's, a, it's been completely rewritten to maximize performance on cloud hardware. And it's, uh, it's able to improve performance across workload types, but it's specifically uh, compatible with uh, Spark APIs. So there's gonna be probably a deep dive on Photon, it sounds like here soon. Um, I was able to catch part of that session but let me let me go ahead and keep uh and this is probably going to be a recap a little bit from wednesday but um, you guys will just have to put up with it so this is uh the photon component so what they're talking about is uh redeveloping the native execution uh that's purpose built for cpu performance using vectorization, which brings in the data level parallelism we talked about, along with instruction level parallelism. So the, uh, the data level parallelism is that optimization for SSDs we talked about. The instruction level is essentially taking advantage of uh, modern uh, CPU architecture um, to essentially read in, yeah, sorry, uh, SIMD architecture to process more data points with a single instruction. So if you look, this on the left, or th this is the code for doing um, an aggregation, right? Written in C++. The old way with the, with the inner loop, it would get turned into this instruction, right? Now over here, you can see that we're able to do any of these things with a V that's for the V instructions, which are these massively parallelized instructions. And so basically it's able to process more data with only one cycle on the CPU or one instruction call. And so that's taking out one of the highest overheads on your performance and improves the parallelism at the instruction level perform or at the uh, instruction level. And so that gets you up to a 4X speed up. And the example they used was um, redeveloping their hash table data structure. Um, so, you know, that's a, a huge essential data structure within data engineering, especially. But what it does is it introduces a lot of random memory loads. So CPUs are really fast. So if we're, uh, if we're waiting on CPU cycles, we're kind of wasting a good chunk of our time where we could be doing useful work. So what they focused on doing was breaking up their bigger processing loops like up here into smaller ones. And so that gets, uh, that gets better runtime because the most expensive parts of the cycle become their own loops. And so the data lookup task, which previously took the longest because you're only doing it once per loop, when you have that isolated out on its own, suddenly the CPU can process that and sort of go ahead and prefetch upcoming data similar to a prefetcher on a web page. So that's all pretty pretty huge. Um, so, you know, those are really the highlights of the announcements that I've seen. Um, I'll probably have to uh, do another video uh, diving deeper into some of the workshops, but just looking back, um, the things that really uh, struck me are, are what I covered here. And I'm, I'm most excited about Spark 3, um, but 
the Databricks uh, editions of Redash and Databricks projects, and then the announcement of the Delta engine um, are uh, unexpected, to say the least. We all knew Spark 3 was coming, but I, did, I, you know, I could not have known unless you're at Databricks what they're going to announce at the conference, and I couldn't be more thrilled about what ended up getting announced. So over the next couple months, I'll be diving deep into all those new features in Databricks, and you know, th this weekend and early next week, I'll be recapping uh, some of the workshops I sat in on in more detail and doing more of this comprehensive coverage. Um, also, next Tuesday um, is going to be the Vorm Databricks user group session on ML Flow. And then the last Tuesday of July is going to be um, a whole session um, recap of the conference. So. That's all I've got for today. Thanks for checking out the stream.